I didn't realize how in the world that you and I were going to become with each other. I'll take it. I'd rather be on this side. That's it. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, there's uh, sandwiches and drinks and stuff in the back, so please feel free. There's lots of sandwiches, so please feel free to grab as much as you'd like uh, when you want. The restrooms are down the stairs off to your left if you need to use them. And um, I just want to say thank you to all of our panelists for coming here today. Uh, we really appreciate you guys taking your time to discuss water with us and how it relates to Pueblo County and uh, what we can do for the future. So with that, if all of our panelists, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourselves, maybe give us a little bit of background about yourselves and uh, how you are related to water. Um, and then and then maybe tell us, you know, why water is important to you. And then we'll kick off with our list of questions and hopefully um, spark some discussion with the audience. So Mike, you want to start us off? I'm Mike Hill. <coughs> Excuse me. I've been with the Best for Ditch Company for 44 years uh, as of this coming Friday. April, for, April Fool's Day, April 44 Fool's Day? years ago. Very good. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, we irrigate, we originally set up under the Best for to irrigate 20,000 acres, which St. Charles Mesa Water District owns about 10%. They've taken some of it out of production. Um, here about 2009, uh, Yellow Board of Waterworks came in and bought 27% of the best rate with a long term plan, uh, like a 100 year plan. Uh, not take water out of production agriculture right now, uh, but at least the back to the Farm works for twenty dollars an acre, or fifty dollars an acre foot, uh, just the cost of the, the yearly assessment. And here this year, they put out another ten year. They've extended it ten years. Um, we still have quite a few acres under under production, and it's very valuable water. Don't have water. I've always said when the faucet's off, faucet's off. There's no more. Uh, with this drought the way it is, there's a lot of factors that are playing against agriculture. Um, what else you want me to... That's great, thanks. Chris, you want to <clears throat> take it okay. You have it, Chris. I don't want to ramble for a long time. <laughs> I'm, I'm Chris Witka, and I didn't put who I was representing because there's a couple of water hats I still wear. I, um, I was a reporter at the Pueblo Chieftain for probably 30 years covering water issues. And um, really got a good background in that, uh, learning about water and stuff. So there was an opportunity about six years ago to go to work for the Southeastern Colorado Water Conservancy District. I've been there since 2016. Um, in 2019, I was elected to the Pueblo Board of Water Works. So, know a little bit about water right now. And uh, I, I think it's it's just all, it's the one subject in the world that fascinates me more than any other because water is so vital uh, to all aspects of life. Uh, and take it for granted in cities and you know, a lot of the time because you just turn on your faucet and the water comes out. And that and that's kind of a you know an attitude that I've tried to uh, counter throughout all, both my careers and and try to let people know where their water comes from and what it takes to, to get it to um, <clears throat> as far as agriculture goes, I was for about seventeen years I was a in charge of a lateral on the best market, the Midnight Avenue uh, irrigation company, and learned a little bit about the inner workings of ditch companies 
whether they're large or small, are all about the same, you have the same type of personalities on them. And it's always a politically charged atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> as Mike said, a lot of the water that's on the, the Bessemer ditches will eventually be converted to municipal use. And that's a, that's a good thing. It keeps the water in the area. It's not a good thing because we have to take acres out of production when, we, when the water is finally converted into municipal use. So it, it's a, a double-edged sword, but you know, in, in all my roles, I feel it's a necessary one. Uh, the Southeast District, I'll do a little hype here. This is our uh, 60th anniversary of the district and the district was formed in 1958 by farmers and by cities that petitioned into the district. Uh, what we do is we bring water from the Colorado River Basin um, through a tunnel up by Turquoise Lake. We have a collection system on the west slope that brings that water in. And then we, what we do is provide supplemental water for people in the Arkansas Valley, all the way from Salida to Lamar, um, from Pina Vista to Lamar, yeah, from Pina Vista. Because, um, and so our our mission is, you know, to, to provide both municipal and agricultural water. Uh, we, we, tr we have allocation principles, which relate to some of these questions that I'll talk about later. Um, but I, I, I feel like agricultural water is important to me because I like to eat. So I think we need agricultural water. Thank you. Hi, Dylan? Dylan? <laughs> Hi, y'all. Uh, my name is Dylan O'Hare. I'm the Community Conservation Manager of Palmer Land Conservancy. Uh, Palmer is a land and water conservation organization that's been around here in southeastern Colorado in the Arkansas Basin for about 44 years now. Um, I opened up our Pueblo office in June of last year, so our permanent presence is pretty new here in Pueblo, but we've been working here in Pueblo County um, for a number of years now, uh, specifically on Bessemer Farmland Conservation Project. So I'm sure most of y'all are aware, but I've definitely heard just now, you know, that Pueblo has purchased, uh, you know, a significant portion of the water off of the Bessemer Ditch to lease it back to farmers, so everything is under production. Uh, with the Bessemer Farmland Conservation Project, what we have an opportunity to do is work with the water, work with producers under the Bessemer Ditch to maintain a critical mass of irrigated acreage on the Bessemer Ditch, um, just to make sure that these agricultural communities can stay whole into the future and to make sure that Pueblo gets its full yield that it purchased so that the, the city here can continue to thrive and grow into the future too. So we're here to, uh, you know, bring resources and tools to the table to look for win-win solutions that I can go into more detail about later. I'm sure that we'll get into it with some of the questions, but um, that's that's Palmer. That's primarily what we're doing here in Pueblo County, among other conservation projects. Um, and water, water is important because it connects us. Um, whether it's irrigation water that helps you uh, maintain your lifestyle and provide for your family um, or help provide for the communities through the food that we eat um, or the water that we run from the tap whether you know people are aware that it comes from a river or an aquifer or not um, I think water it, uh, it's what it's what connects us it's what we can all rally behind and I think it's important to build an awareness of you know how precious and uh, oftentimes scarce that resource is. Absolutely. Thank you all for being here. Um, so shall we get started with the first question? Um, what we've got here is what does current the current state of the lower Arkansas River look like? Uh, and how are the flows and will flow demands be met in state and out of state? Or will more water be sent downstream to meet those demands? Any one of you can chime in. Okay, <clears throat> I made a few notes. Yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you. The, the snowpack is, right now is average, which it doesn't seem like it. Um, 
my wife the other day said it well it seems like it's really dry again this year well it kind of is but it's just not really wet we've had about average precipitation a little bit above average i think it's kind of cool. <clears throat> the snowpack is has been kind of piling up plateauing and then piling up so it, it, right now is this week it's about 100 percent in both the colorado river basin and in the arkansas river basin um <clears throat> The, the final snowpack will be determined by the remaining storms that we have through in the next month or so. Arkansas River flows have been below average almost every day since January 1st. And that, that it's kind of a complicated situation there, even though you, I, I just said, you know, precipitation is about average, but what plays into it is the soil moisture. So because we've had a really dry 2021 and sort of dry 2020 that soil moisture is is really pretty far down and when the river comes through goes into the banks it fills all the cracks and crevices below ground so we're so this the stream flow it hasn't kept up with the precipitation and snowpack the outlook from uh, National Weather Service is hotter and drier than usual. For the next three months, probably for the next six months. Uh, weak La Nina, I think, it, and that never is good for Southern Colorado. Um, we're still in a moderate drought on the, on the uh, National Drought Monitor in the Pueblo and Ontario County area, and it goes over to severe stream in Crowers County. Uh, reservoir storage in the basin, about 90%. And it's a little bit drier at the Colorado River Basin, where we get our supplemental water from. And in terms of, you know, leasing water, Pueblo Water decided not to do a farm lease program this year for a second era row because we're rebuilding storage at this time. So that's my weather report. All right. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions in regards to, to flow and amounts that Chris might be able to expand a little bit more on? I do. <clears throat> so I was just wondering where they measure the flow from because like to me it would seem like coming downstream from the reservoir is determined by what the reservoir releases. But, so where is that measured? The the um, the flow is measured at a series of gauges. There's some more important than others. Um, uh, uh, there's the above, it's called the above Pueblo gauge, but it's actually the world Pueblo dam. Oh. Um, it, it's the first key gauge that we have. It, so it's a by uh, go on Pueblo Boulevard across the river, which is well, not Pueblo Boulevard, Juniper Road, yeah. It's right, it's right up there near the camp, Juniper Road, I'm sorry. And yeah, so there's, that. that's a key gauge, Avondale is a key gauge downstream. And then Wellsville, 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 yeah, Wellsville upstream of Pueblo is a key gauge. So there's key gauges on the Arkansas River. There's there, there's actually dozens of gauges throughout the entire Arkansas basin on tributaries and streams and that kind of like that. So we have a, a pretty good real time picture of, of how much water's in the river. And the division engine division two water engineer Phil Kiner is in the process of developing it. Uh, colors of water model for the Arkansas Basin that, that would be accessible to the public you could go on and we, we already have a kind of a rudimentary version of that but we're, we're improving that and making it more robust but, but we have a good idea of what water is doing above the reservoir and below the reservoir um, 
when you when you talk about how much water is coming out of the dam, sometimes you see more going in and less coming out, and sometimes you see less going in and more coming out. That's a function of how Pueblo Reservoir operates. So we uh, and and a lot of our accounts with the, the southeastern district is the local agency in charge of Pueblo Reservoir. The Bureau of Reclamation owns and operates it. We provide a lot of the operating information. So, when uh, when people are calling for their water that's been stored in the reservoir, the flows below the dam will be greater than the flows coming in. At other times of year, the flows that are coming in may be stored for future exchanges downstream. An exchange is just you take water from one place and release it from another place out of priority. Mm -hmm. okay. How much is coming through the tunnel right now? <clears throat> to Houston? Houston? Yeah. We haven't started yet. Uh -huh. It's too soon. Oh, yeah. Sorry, it March. was too warm today. I was... <laughs> <laughs> it yeah. always runs a little bit. Yeah, but, uh, but no, no, I was a month ahead. You were about, you're about uh, a month ahead. We haven't, uh, yeah, we haven't, um, yeah. Even been up there to unlock the system yet? That starts in a couple of weeks. So, we do that about mid April, the reclamation will go up and start clearing things out. So. Great. All right. Well, um, let's move on to the next question. Mike, this is probably a little bit more for you. Um, kind of a similar question about flows in the Bessemer ditch this year. Um, is that going to affect? What, whatever the flows are looking like, is that going to affect large and small farms differently? And how will that be for them? Um, the way the flows are, are looking right now, um, it's really going to be tough in July and August. Okay. Um, some of the more critical time of the year that the crops need the, need the water. We didn't have the early stone back. Uh, and we are getting some later now, but that tends to melt run out a lot sooner and a lot faster. Um, last year, I know of, of one farm, and, and there was a lot of farms that actually cut back on their acreage. Mm -hmm. uh, one, which I won't mention, I know he's cut back some or between 25 and 30%. I, I would estimate about 26 to 27%, uh, which you can look at their water is their pro rata amount that their shares, the number of shares that they have. So uh, when I don't have a lot of water, everybody suffers, small farms and sure. large farms. Okay. Um, a lot of the large farms raise a lot more crops, uh, feed, vegetables. Um, it's affecting them, but it's affecting the small guy too. Sure. It's, could be very devastating this year. Um, that guy that cut back 26, 27%, they might be cutting back 35 to 40 this year. Jeez. Um, it's going to depend on you know, what happens with, with the water. You know, storage amounts were up uh, compared to what they really originally looked like. It really looked bad, didn't it, Chris? Yeah, it was. Uh, we actually finished pretty good, mm -hmm. uh, all of us. But like Chris said, there's no supplement water this year. You can't, the cities are, are refilling their storage vessel. Right. Um, so it's it's going to be tough okay. on agriculture. Yeah. And that's my concern. I, I know <laughs> when uh, farmers can't raise their crops and make a living, then they start looking at other options, which the option is a supplement water. Sure. Uh, yeah. So it makes you makes you wonder, you know, yeah. what's actually going to happen, how bad it's going to be. Yeah. Christine, absolutely. can I ask Mike a question? Please, absolutely. Maybe, uh, maybe you, were you referring when you were visiting, kind of with Chris a little bit? Did winter water come out better than you had anticipated, yeah, Michael? I, I really thought it, we ended up. If I remember, it was fifty-six something. Yeah, it ended up being about ninety-two percent. Was on ninety two thousand total. Was it ninety two thousand total? It it uh, ended 
Actually, which is which is enough. still below the average, but better than it looked like early on. Yeah. And how does that how does that relate? How does that translate to a a fellow? Let's say let's say I have a a hundred acres on the Bessemer Ditch, and I'm in winter water. When you you because everybody gets a piece of the winter water, yeah. I you think it's pro rata. It's now. pro rata amount. Do you get? Can you can you squeeze out a half an acre foot or four tenths of an acre foot? Is that kind of how it works, Mike? You think? Something like that. We probably get about a. Well, it was about a foot re tenths. Yeah, we we had about three acre foot. That counted everything: though. our project water, our winter water, and our. Uh, I was just three. talking about project. It was, oh. it was right at about three tenths of a foot. Yeah, three tenths of a foot. I thought he said my hearing's trouble. Okay. Three okay. acre feet, uh, which we weren't quite that total, but um, yeah, about about three tenths of an acre foot. Okay. Which, when you're looking at the river flows, and we've got 14 senior decrees, um, if we can hold, hold those decrees. Our flow will be about 71 CFS. It's not a lot when it's 110 degrees the wind's blowing. Right. Yeah. For, right. I it's, tough. it's tough. It's tough. Because that's kind of where you guys are right now. I just looked before I came. You know, we about 72 maybe? Yeah. 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 Which is really pretty typical. It's, yeah. Yeah. Um, Early season. Because we've seen it drop to 43 in the spring. Right. Um, don't know where it's going to go. You know the whole. The, I always say the system's drying the out. The system's drying, and it's out. been drying out for two years. We need rain. We need snow. And it needs to go into the ground, recharge it, keep the senior water right running. Right. It's going to be tough. Got it. We need rain. As a general rule, the seventy foot ditch is half of the water. It'll irrigate half of our water. That's right. Got it. Okay. That's if helpful. you don't have any other supplemental water. Okay. Got it. Okay. And the, the snowpack, it's kind of misleading because I've seen it in all the years I've been at the ditch be over 100% in the wind blow, like it's doing now, and we don't get a drop of runoff. It's not a little Yeah. No, I, no, we've been running a, we've been running, uh, yeah, on our is. system, we've been running like a, a gauging station at, um, or our own snow tell, what do you want yeah. to call it? We read a, we have a snow course at, at Grizzly. At Twin Lakes, and it looks yeah. right now it's a little bit below normal. But I'm, I, yeah. I agree. You look, it looks good, and all of a sudden, you call up there, and the guy says, "Well, you know, it's it's warm, and it's just not making water." Is what it. And everybody, you know, they look at well, it's 100 percent. Well, it's 100 percent for this time of year. We still got a lot. We still at least another 30 out. days of. Snow production, I would argue, so, I guess. There's a lot of factors. The peak becomes about mid April. Mid April. Mid April. Okay. okay. Thanks, God. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. But don't give up till the middle of May. <laughs> <laughs> I know well, that's, it, in recent years, that's where we've been getting killed. Yeah. I mean, we, we get okay, we get to the middle of April, and we'll get the peak. And, and, then, and then everything shuts it off. It doesn't snow again until June. Right or and then, it, right, and yeah. it'll rain then. Or rain, yes. Yeah. One of one of the interesting things that we found out a, a couple of years ago through one of the presentations that was <clears throat> was done by the Bureau of Reclamation is that about thirty percent of our prior water comes over in the form of rainfall after the snow melt. That that kind of you know, it hit both Garrett and myself by surprise because we're going, oh, we didn't know that. <laughs> and and when that, when we don't get those monsoons, then or if you have another problem on the opposite end. So, yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we're going to skip question three real quick um, because I want to get Dylan's input a little bit on question four. And that's what do you think the future holds regarding water in the lower arc? Uh, and the Bessemer Ditch, I guess that's for everybody, but um, is agriculture sustainable here with respect to water? So yeah. if you can give us a little bit of conservation knowledge. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, I think we could all agree that the front range isn't going to stop growing anytime soon. And uh, we all know that there's the, there's the front range. And I mean, the spouties continue to grow, they've got to get their water from somewhere. So here on the Bessemer and throughout the lower Arkansas Valley, there's definitely going to be a pressure on irrigators um, from our municipalities making 
probably some generous offers on water. Um, that's that's what I, I would expect um, throughout the throughout the lower art um, in the future. Uh, that that pressure is going to continue to exist. So, is agriculture sustainable? I think it is. It just depends on the decisions that we make. Um, you know, we've got a lot of options at our disposal. Um, whether it's choosing to be more efficient with our irrigation and seeking out, you know, funding from conservation organizations or the NRCS or or other folks that are out there to help with irrigation improvements to, um, you know, use the little water that we do have. Um, here on the Bessemer, when we're looking at uh, is ag sustainable here, I think it is too. I, I mentioned the Bessemer Farmland Conservation Project as an opportunity to retain a critical mass of irrigated acres, acreage under the Bessemer Ditch. So um, in 2039, or whenever Pueblo Water decides to call on some of its water and fallow fields, um, the decision really is, you know, which fields are we going to dry up? And that's where Palmer Land Conservancy is looking to work with landowners to, uh, you know, choose which farms are going to dry up because we have the we have a tool now, uh, a substitution of dry up provision that's in Pueblo Water's decree that allows us to move water from one farm to another. Uh, and that's important because you can't do that on any other ditches here in Colorado or the Rocky Mountain West. It's an opportunity for Pueblo to really lead um, in terms of being a thought leader and an innovator in the water management space. So, you know, how we choose to follow fields is important to the sustainability of agriculture, how we choose to irrigate those fields, the crops that we choose to uh, plant in those fields. Those are all decisions that can determine whether or not it's going to be sustainable in the future. Any input from the audience or Chris that or Mike? That was exactly my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Better crop selection, more efficient irrigation, the choice of which land to irrigate. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Pretty simple. Wow. We're, we're, we're singing from the same playbook. <laughs> and I, I would say I'm already starting to see what you're talking about in the last three or four months. I am getting more and more inquiries from people of what would you pay for a share of Bessemer Ditch? Um, it's illuminating. Mm -hmm. And one of, one of the inside stories on why the Pueblo Board of Water Works bought water on the Bessemer Ditch was at the time there was an active effort by people in El Paso County by the Bessemer Ditch. And the Pueblo Water Board, that was not on at the time, I was merely writing about it at the time. But decided to do it as more of a defensive move to keep the water in this area rather than let go out. There, yeah, there, there wouldn't be an opportunity for the Bessemer Farmland Conservation Project to exist at level of water not done that, but I don't think that any other farming municipalities would be interested in working uh, with us to keep these communities whole. So I, I think that it's, uh, it was a really forward thing for the time. So that, that deal did go through where you can move water from non-productive land to, wait a minute, did it go through or not? Yes. But no, it, it's put in their decree, but it's still going to have to go to court if that's what they do, if they decide to do. Am I correct? Yes, yeah, so what um, we're doing right now is we're working um, on lining up the first yeah. pilot exchange okay. to to take yeah. this through the court and and that was my understanding yeah. Was, yeah yeah you made it sound like it, it happened no uh, maybe i missed something but, oh but, no the, the provision no. was added into the decree. okay yeah okay when they were when they were talking about the <clears throat> super ditch further down in the valley that was always a big sticking point with it because you know you couldn't you couldn't pick and choose which land to irrigate with the water that you had left. But I, I think that that is a real forward thinking move that um, will allow better land to be irrigated and the better crops maybe remain economically viable. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, um, any other questions before we move on to the next? So then I guess any one of you guys can answer this. Um, maybe all three of you might chime in. What incentives do farmers and ranchers have to use water conservation methods on their land? 
anybody? I had a, I had a short answer on that. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it as a test. <laughs> um, I, I'm not as familiar with the incentives that are in place, at, so I answered it in kind of a theoretical, theoretical way. Um, that I would think that any incentives, they need to be economic incentives. You can't just shoot out of the goodness of your heart. Um, well, you could, and some people do, but sure. you know, for widespread conservation methods, you, you'll, you're going to need to have economic in, in, uh, incentives. So if the conservation can come with increased yields or without a reduction in the total water supply, um, maybe if when people are producing less, prices are a little bit better, then it, it kind of can become a, a closed loop. As, as Mike said, the farmers are looking at it this time of year and saying there might not be much water, so I'm going to cut back a number of acres or I'm going to plant, I'm going to plant an extra little bit of onions this year and hope they make a good crop and I get more money. Uh, you know, so that that's sort of the incentive. I, I think that I, I don't know what other kind of incentives you could offer. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I'll put, I'll put it that way. Other than through maybe Dylan's type of program. Yeah, yeah, you know, with, with some of the one thing, yeah, we've got these tools that we bring to the table. When I say tools, but also resources. So when we look to conserve land, but with producers, um, you know, primarily through conservation easements, that's the bread and butter tool, but we like to try to stack value into, into these um, agreements so that producers can come out better. And if that means going and finding funding to improve uh, that situation, for sure. Um, I Also, when I read this question, I think to flip it on its head and um, I'm more posing this to to the group and to everybody as a discussion um, because I don't think I understand it completely. But I see water conservation as a, a more or less a disincentive the way that it's structured right now. Um, if you don't use your allotted amount of water, you know it takes a while to get on the abandonment list. But if you don't use it, you eventually lose it. So you may as well use your entire yield. Um, it's the same in a full water year. So I don't know if you want to comment on that component of water law um that's something that i'm looking to learn more about but i do see it as a disincentive to water conservation or being more efficient yeah i from everything i've seen that is somewhat true I, i've seen you know people try to irrigate with insufficient water and you know, and, and, and fighting for every drop, you know, was, was uh, one thing. I have a funny story about the Bessemer Ditch. When I was on a lateral of good night and I didn't know very much, I was a younger, much younger man then. Uh, some of the older guys on um, on our lateral would always bellyache about not having enough, not getting our full share of water. and not because we didn't we needed the water we were just growing little you know home gardens with it there but because they felt like they were somehow not getting their full share of water so one of those old guys and myself were designated to go to the Bessemer ditch meeting that year and and complain about this well that was a big mistake (laughs) they because what had been kind of an open lock on our head gate now that was a had an actual lock on it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I learned a little lesson in water there is that uh, pick what you get and don't throw a fit. That, <laughs> that's kind of the, the lesson there. Um, but but that that kind of attitude, I think, for a lot of years was prevailing, and it was it was just like. We'll take our water and we're not going to do anything to help you um, down there. Between ditches, it often uh, can still be like that. But, you know, people people feel like they're not getting 
the best deal there. So as Dylan said, a disincentive, yes, it's water law the way it's written. It's a, a use it or lose it proposition a lot of the time. And <clears throat> even something as common sense simple as moving water to a better parcel of land requires going to water for it. It gets fought by lawyers who don't really under, understand or know the water, but, but are just looking for justice for their clients for some abstract reason. You posed a question to us, and I, I'll give you my answer. Where we live in a almost arid, they call it semi arid, but it's arid here. There is no incentive to not use every drop of water we get because. Water is our biggest limiting factor in yield production, bar none. If I can put another irrigation on it, it'll pay for itself time and time again. So there is no incentive for us not to use water. I don't, I mean, even drip, sprinkler, all that stuff saves water, but still, the more water you can put on it, the more crop you can produce. That's bar, plain and simple. Yeah. We want all the water we can get and a little bit more. So, yeah, I think that makes sense. I mean, if it's a, a really, if it's the wettest year, theoretically, right? If there's too much water, but then, yeah, you know, I mean, we're, but, we're in I, theory I, right now. But. but I'm gonna agree with Hollis in a sense. And I don't know if, you know, lose it or use it. I mean, I think that that word, get, that term is thrown around and it really, quite frankly, only applies to a very small segment of water users where if they were so rich in water or you know there was really very little regulation they took whatever they wanted to and those type of things but i think what we're not what what we can't do that they can do in other places for instance like the imperial valley and the coachella is because they're in a different system they can re benefits from being efficient. They can actually have Los Angeles come in and line their ditches, put in sprinklers, put in surge valves, and they can make a calculation on how much less water they use per acre. And the cities then will use that water. In our case, because of our water rights structure, our prior appropriation system, whatever Matt saves on his farm, theoretically goes to the next water right user. But I would argue that we're all in the same boat. If, if you're a senior or a junior, as a junior, it's just, I'm just gonna take the pain first. But the seniors, if, if all we have is a right to divert, if it's not there to divert, we can't use it. So, so I just think, I think that we are incentivized. And if, whether you call it efficacy, efficiency, pick whatever term you want, you know, a good farmer will figure out what those critical thresholds are and do what Haas does and we all do and try to maximize the amount of crop we can grow for the, the crop with the highest value using the less acre inches per crop. That's where we're, that's kind of what we're trying to focus on, right? Is trying to find that magic balance in how we farm and who our customers are and trying to figure out whether it's using, you know, uh, and our, I see Lana in the back. We've done a lot of work with her and her agency. You know, it's amazing how much water you save when you stick a pipe, you pick, stick water in a pipe versus an earth ditch. So I think we'll continue to go there, but we might just be kind of, um, what's the word? I'm paddling in the lake and, 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 uh, keeping our head above water because if the system we're keeps drawing out, we're just going to have less to divert, right, Mike? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you're just going to have less water to deliver to your shareholders. Yep. And they're going to have to make decisions about how to manage that. How to manage it, what to plant. What, what to plant, yeah. you know, uh, you know, In should some of those- them too, and the Haas can tell you, we were really bad. At one point we were, there were 32 CFS. Uh, 31 right along in there and uh, I got 34 miles of canal yeah and the loss is terrible you looked at yeah. the hay fields the hay was almost dead over half the way down 
Yeah, you got to figure point. out what you're going to plant and there's a keep lot, alive. You know, yeah. There's a lot to it. I mean, we might just, I mean. And it might start raining next month and <laughs> be the wettest year that we have. It's done that before. But I go, I mean, I just, you know, I think farmers and irrigators are just going to have to make that management decision yeah. on where they think the future is going and how much more you can bet on a May like we had last May, which yeah. saved our asses, right? I mean, I was, I was done. If it you, rained. you see more hosses doing it, no till, and they're trying to put that back into the ground to hold that moisture in there. And it's working as a boss. I can tell by driving around that it's, it, you guys are holding the moisture a lot a better. Tool. It, it is, it's a great tool. It, it's Everybody a... needs to look at it. Yeah. No, and you can do it with some crops, some crops you can't. Yeah. You know, we're trying right. to do it as well. It's not a cure-all. Right? No, no, right. but it, it helps structure yeah. it up. Yeah. I think what you said about diversity of crops, that's another huge thing. It, it is. You know, we can grow two acres of sorghum on the same water I can grow one acre of corn on. Yeah. And sometimes it's better to have the acre corn kind of, just like you said, if you can get some rain, you know, you got a shot. It, yeah. I know, you know, we've got good water rights under the bus for You have a pretty good, yeah. I, I consider you a pretty senior ditch when, yeah, I, when I talk we, to uh, people. There's a few farms and they're not big farms. But these guys, there are some of the ones that complain that we don't have enough water and they're not getting their share. But every acre they have is planned in hay. And even with their good water rights, the way it is, you can't, you got to rotate some other crops in there. I would say so. don't take as much water as so. I, 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 uh, pretty hard. Yeah, you can't, yeah, yeah, you, you, pretty, yeah. If you're not diverting six acre feet of water a year, you're not going to keep. You're not going to keep 40 acres or 60 yeah, yeah, or, acres or, or hey, a field of alfalfa which uses you know, 35, 32, 30s. Well, How much? It's a big number, right? Well, it's like four feet. It's, it's like it could be like three or four feet of water, right? So, yeah, I mean, but people are going to have to make those decisions yeah. or they're going to go out of business, right? Or something's going to happen, right? We have a question online uh, cool. for Mike. Uh, it says, how many flow gauges currently exist on the Bessemer ditch? And would there be any benefit to any new technologies to monitor flow rate and head gate distributions? There's stuff out there and we're checking into it presently. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of new technology out there. And uh, part of an IGA that um, St. Charles Mesa Water District had with Pebble Water with their change case was to put some new measures in under the best one. Um, I was able to sit down with Alan Ward and uh, we got two new Rubicon gates put in, which is very good. Uh, I get a lot of uh, information off that. Uh, it's technology. Mm -hmm. um, We've got 87 laterals, which I know Haas, he's been, he's looked at that. Uh, if there might be some money available, we're looking at, at going with some automated gates. But then you got to look, if I remember what Haas said, it's about $1,800 a year okay. to run them uh, a piece. Yeah. So if, hopefully the expense goes down on it. There's technology out there. I feel that. We're, we're working that way, but it's very expensive. Uh, it's hard, especially when you don't have water and the crops aren't being raised under your canal. You know, your assessments, if you have to raise it and, uh, <laughs> yeah. to cover some of that stuff. But if there's some money available, we're going to make an attempt to get it. But there's a lot of, lot of different things. Um, spill gates even some additional measures, uh, lining. Um, we lose quite a bit of water. Uh, with Keblo Reservoir, when Keblo Reservoir was built, it took all the silt out of our canal. Mm -hmm. So we're running clear water, and at times it looks like it's coming right out of the ground, don't it, uh, There's no silt in it. So 
we did uh, here, I think it was about five years ago, we did about a million dollar project out west of town, putting liner in, uh, put the wall in to reinforce our bank. Uh, this winter, we've put um, a new measure in, in Avondale. Uh, we're still working on getting it up and running. Um, and it's kind of an IGA between the best firm, Kevlar Water. Um, we went actually went in and lined our, our salt or our St. Charles siphon. Um, it's a five hundred five hundred thirty-five to five hundred and fifty feet of steel. Uh, it's been in the ground since the seventies. It hasn't had any maintenance done to it. Um, went, hired a company to go in and sandblast it and put a liner on it. So we're doing a lot of stuff upgrading the canal. But there's a lot of stuff out there that we can still work at, I think. Okay. Um, I, I know we have old head gates uh, in the change case with Pebble Water. Uh, we had Pebble Water's engineer and our engineer. And um, I took them, explained to them how this measuring, the submerged orifice calculation, everything went on. They scratched their head and they said, they can't believe that the water is as accurate as it is at the way we're doing it. So it's not something that everybody's getting shorted, but it's something, there's a lot of stuff in the future that could make it a lot easier to right. distribute the water. And, mm -hmm. uh, the quickness of it, it, it won't be there because it's kind of a, a time delay at moving water from one head gate to another. Uh, but there's, there's stuff out there, and I'm sure technology is going to get a lot better and hopefully a lot more reasonable. Yeah, that's as far as well. Yeah. Agreed. Cool. Did that? Yeah. yeah. That's a good one. So, how much loss is there just in the in the best work? Well, at, at different times, uh, when we're running 32, 31, 32 CFS, <laughs> I was running about a 44% loss in 34 miles. Um, that's just in the best part, not that's the whole, not yeah, the, that's the what areas. I'm diverting. And then you've got a loss on your laterals yeah. too, on top of that. Um, there's times that I squeeze a 10% loss out of it. Uh, Mother Nature's helping us out with a little bit of rain. Uh, it's not getting the wind, the heat, all that stuff. There's other times at 71 that I've ran about a 20, 22 percent loss. There's a lot of variables. But yeah, the less that we run, the higher the loss is. Plus the last one down there, so. <laughs> I read a, an article the other day that might interest you guys. There's a big ditch in, I think it's in California, that they're covering the whole ditch with solar panels. Oh, I saw that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, they keep tumbleweeds out. Of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. 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 I, I, I heard that, but I haven't seen the article. Yeah, yeah. I think somebody give them a grant to do it. Yeah, they're gonna line four miles of it this year. And see how it works. See if they can cut the or tell if they're cut their losses down. Yeah, hmm. you'd think it it help with the loss. Aaron and I one time facetiously came up with an idea that we would put floating solar panels that also generated a little bit of electricity <laughs> and the wave current on top of the reservoir and yeah. that would also stop evaporation. Yeah. So but all that kind of thinking takes a lot of money to make it happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's a project like that uh, in Boulder County that I've heard about, I don't know much about that. But I saw that article too. Mm -hmm. I didn't read it, um, I just read the headline, so I'm an expert. Yeah, but uh, it, was, it looks like a really wide ditch. It's a, it's, it's, a, it's, one, it's, a, it's one of those monster Colorado, uh, California canals that carry basically the Sacramento River to, you know, thousands and thousands, thousands of, of, farm, of farm. <laughs> yeah. I guess to feed on what Dylan was just talking about, Boulder County's got some interesting stuff rolling right now. Because they even have some experimental farms that they're growing crops under solar panels and finding they're getting some relative success with it and 
that could shape for an interesting future for farming too. Get real little tractors. <laughs> <laughs> you and I might be out. <laughs> if you don't meet the height risk, the height limit is there. Yes. <laughs> okay. bring, bring back childhood. <laughs> If you did that to Pebble Park, it's going to win the football. <laughs> you know, that's, that's it. We also, we have, Jim and I also have a plan to put little wind, horizontal wind generators. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll that. Wonderful. Um, well, let's kind of shift gears just a little bit. We've kind of been hearing a lot about lack of water and how that works. Um, but this is kind of coming from um, a quality standpoint. So any or all three of you can take a stab at it. Um, is surface water pollution an issue uh, in the Arkansas River below the confluence in the Bessemer ditch? It's open to pollutants. And then what can farmers and ranchers do to improve their water quality? West softball. Yeah. I wouldn't touch that with a 10. Oh, our water is perfect, isn't it? <laughs> one of one of the reasons that we're building the Arkansas Valley conduit is because the communities downstream are starting to get citations. Uh, for a lot of years, it was mainly the radium from the deep wells we were concerned about, but um, our a lot of our participants in the Arkansas Valley Conduit have uh, groundwater under the direct influence of surface water. And so with the, that water quality that comes out, that becomes a big issue for those small towns down in the Arkansas Valley. And on the other end, because of the naturally occurring selenium that's in the water, a lot of the uh, communities there have, have will benefit from the Arkansas Valley Conduit by having a cleaner source water that they have to remove less selenium from. So it is it is a big issue for us and, and I'm not going to presume to tell the farmers how to make that any easier for us because um, that's not how the regulations are set up. The regulations right. are set up on the municipal providers to, to do it. Um, <clears throat> one of the biggest problems Pueblo has it uh, on their wastewater side is, is that a lot of the older lines leach some of the naturally occurring selenium water into the system so they have more selenium to take out of the water at the wastewater plant than was being put in through the system alone. So and I, I think it selenium is is probably the most troublesome contaminant in the Arkansas Valley mm -hmm. because all of the formations that our water flows over load that at various points along the river. Mm -hmm. And uh, anything you do to, you know, if you use and reuse water, which is what we want to do, um, <clears throat> to Matt's point that you use the return flows off of one farm off the next farm down the line, that also increases the concentration of selenium as it flows over those formations. So, um, <clears throat> been a lot of work done on that. It's a lot of non-point source. And as far as just the natural processes, I don't know what more you could do with that. Okay. I've been monitoring the Buffalo Ditch water for 20 years and our, our pH levels have went up about from about 7.7 .7 to about 8.1, 8.2 in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And the only thing we can attribute it to is the up above the reservoir, we're picking up more salt and more more right. chemicals. That, uh, it would be the, it would have to be the uh, chemically, I think, but chemistry would have to be those. I mean, when you mean, yeah, pollutes, I mean, it could be like chlorides or sulfides and things of that nature that are sure. typically salts. Right? Because there's, yeah, there's right. nothing there's changed. Nothing, nothing else has changed. Exactly. Right? It yeah. has to be a naturally occurring deal. Right. And it's not a problem, but it's definitely weird that it's changing that path. Yeah. Yeah. 
And what then, do you say is about the springs deal where I see they want to stop sending water back down the fountain and reuse it? Do you think that's going to change the... I mean, the Fountain River is already known as being pretty polluted. It, will it become more so? Well, and, and that's kind of that's kind of hard to say. I, I think we, you know, as far as sediment movement and all that stuff, when the, all those years they were fighting about it, they found that the most of the sediment movement happens during the big flash storm events. Um, the day to day stuff, you know. No, I, I don't I don't think we want want to have the, uh, the PFCs come come down you know through here but I don't know how they migrate I don't think anybody does but as far as the selenium yeah Fountain Creek is a selenium load loading one so if you reduce flows on Fountain Creek but back to where they might have been before they built all the big cities up there it might reduce the city coming down. That could be good. That could be a positive. It could be positive, but then, um, yeah, as long as, you know, the, the farmers downstream like all the sediment that comes washing down there. But as I said, that comes during the big storm events. Yes. And during the big storm events, you have the lower concentration of, of the bad stuff in the water because it's just mm -hmm. too big. Right. So that was kind of the curtailing those day-to-day -day flows those you know the, that might actually have a small improvement on water quality. Well, well I think I think it reflects back to um, some of the discussion that Dylan brought up where you know if you have if you have a farm ground that has you know essentially you know I mean we don't have the deep deep top soils like they have in Minnesota or Iowa but we do have a decent profile where you know you, you still have to take it still takes a while on good productive farmland to find shale or fine groundwater you know the, the closer you're irrigating to groundwater the more you're going to end up mobilizing those those constituents whether it's the fertilizer i put on or whether it's naturally occurring you know those are the fields or farms where where you want to say okay maybe i'm going to put that into permanent cover of grass and not irrigate those and I get a I get a I get an environmental benefit for doing that you know but because I don't think our our system the way we operate is analogous to what happens on the Mississippi where you know corn farmers in the Dakotas and Minnesota and everybody along the tributaries of the, of the, of the Mississippi are putting on Pick a number. You like 300 pounds of N? I've heard bigger numbers, and then it gets mobilized because of rain. You know, and that's why we, so we have drain tile and right, and then you have this these big algae blooms. So, I I mean I don't I, I mean I don't know if we have that kind of an issue, but the issue we have probably is like non-point is where some of those lands that are being watered are just perched, and they're too hot. Their, their groundwater is pretty high, you know, and dealing with those systemically you know, could be advantageous. But then you got to come up with a way to compensate those people, right? So, but um, I, I, it, but the selenium thing is just bad luck, right? It's just the geology we have, the yeah. geomorphology. I think is the actual. We built a We built a dinosaur, and we have a river bottom. A river on top of a bunch of old dead dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I guess we can kind of move on. Uh, kind of a, a similar question to what you know, how pollution in the water is, and and how does agriculture affect water? So you can speak about it in in a pollution sense, or in a conservation sense, or or however um, you'd like to to nod to that. But how does agriculture affect water? I, that, that's kind of an interesting question because mm -hmm. I, would, I would say how does water affect agriculture but how does agriculture affect water so the main thing I thought of when I read that was that 
in, in the frying in the frying pan Arkansas project, which the Southeast District um, manages, we have allocation principles that that say that initially 49% of the water went to agriculture with some of the dry ups that, that happened in Crowley County on the Aurora land, which was taken permanently out of production, which I, I think we realize the mistake that happened there, as opposed to cooperative programs where we buy the water and mix it back. Um, <clears throat> they took another uh, three and some percent out of, of the agricultural allocation. So now our allocation to agriculture it is 45% of all the water we bring over. In practice, because of the storage that cities have and that they can maintain that storage from one year to the next, we have allocated about 72% of the water since the beginning of the project to agriculture. So I think that having that market there affects the amount of water that we were able to make available and use because the main purpose of the project in the district is not to waste the water. So we could we could we have a market for that water. I think that another outcome that you see is uh, when a municipality such as Pueblo and in most years Pueblo would lose water to the farms that there is an outlet for that. And, um, you know, it does seem like a high price when, when farmers get it anywhere from you know, our lease program leases anywhere from 50 to 200 an acre foot. When you consider that for municipal use, it's almost $800 per acre foot. That is, is a discounted use of water that still benefits federal water, but also benefits farmers by using that water <clears throat> otherwise would, would not have been able to use so, and so I, I think there are some impacts where agriculture affects water and then when you get into the you know the conservation water saving methods that are on farm like piping and, and sprinklers and drip irrigation and all that and then I, I think you know, agriculture has the ability to make that water go a little farther and um, through programs like like that. So at the same time, you're, you're using less water, trying, still trying to maximize your crop, you're able to grow more crops. So sure. Absolutely. I guess that's how I would answer that. Well, and I guess you know there is a there is a perception in a, a lot of the bigger cities that agriculture is affecting water quality by over applying of nitrogen and phosphorus and those kind of fertilizers. And I would posit that a good farmer can't afford to over fertilize, and that this is a misconception. And I don't know where it comes from, but I would actually posit that someone in the city fertilizing their lawn probably over fertilizes a whole lot more than any of the farmers yep. out in my district does. So I, I think agriculture's impact on water quality and pollution is actually pretty minimal. Yep. Uh, here especially. Yeah. Yeah. So like, just like we was talking about our deep soils and the infiltration process. We don't have a leaching issue here for fertilizer at all. We use every drop of it. And so. I'm glad you brought that up because that's what I was thinking. I was thinking about the way the fertilization impacts the water. And and, and ultimately, while we're having the conversation, you know, no one wants to factor in all of the nitrogen oxides that come out of your car. Mm -hmm. uh, there's things we do every day that actually help the great water quality a whole lot more than what than what a farm is going to even run off on a bad snowstorm. Snow there were actually some studies that CSU did a few years ago. Jim Dying was doing them there. Um, that that showed that they were they were looking at the effects of following a field. And really that any 
fertilize it you put on a field in one year and say you then you didn't grow a crop on it. It would just stay there until the next year and there were plants there to use it. So it wasn't it wasn't like it all ran off. And in, in an area like like we're in this semi-arid or arid, depending on how you look at it, environment uh, most the main use of water is going to be consumptive use by plants. So if it's not growing crops, it's going to be growing cameras, cottonwoods, or whatever by the rivers, and, you know, vegetation that you in some cases don't want, um, by no means natural. And, and if you're not growing crops with it, it's, it's going to grow those other things. So I, I think, you know, getting healthier crops properly fertilized since we don't have the rich soil as Matt was talking about, then I think that it's very important to keep that in mind. You know, the farms are not the villains here. Christy, can, can you ask Dr. Mike if can he talk? He, yeah, he can talk and he can hear you. So. There's a the CSU down there put in a, a lysimeter is what my understanding is called. It's a big underground crop. Yeah. That's true. Right. Did they did they monitor any of that? As far as I don't I don't as much my understanding they never got anything to the bottom of it. Was that correct? That's not. Yeah, occasionally you do, Haas. You get some down there. So you know we monitor the everything that deep percolates um, that is consumed by the crop, and typically you get it for most crops about thirty acre inches of consumptive use of water. But you know, occasionally when you over irrigate you do get some leaching and but you can you can minimize that right by fish and irrigation you're right but we do get some leaching uh, uh, occasionally with certain crops crops like alfalfa are very efficient at getting all the water that even percolates there they're one of the most efficient at extracting water from even the deeper soil profiles but certain crops like you know when you're irrigating you know, um, uh, even corn or pinto beans or something like that early in the season, you will get a little bit of leaching that won't ever be able to be uh, captured by those roots. Mike, Michael, is there any fertilizer? Did they monitor any of that? Yes, yeah, so we'll, we'll monitor also some of that in the, le the leachate that goes down below. And it, it is it is pretty minimal. Again, it's just depending on how efficient your fertilizer application practices. And as you mentioned, you know, we're, we're not, in the old days, putting on a, a bunch of fertilizer, front loading it before those root systems are able to intercept it. So we're we're looking at being able to put in it through sprinkler systems when the root systems are established, or through drip systems, or uh, you know side dressing it later on once those roots have an ability to intercept it. So I think you know maybe initially and in years ago when we front loaded a lot of pre-plant fertilizer. There was probably a higher percentage of that that leached below the uh, root zone, but as you said, just because of the economics, that's kind of went by the wayside. And then, Mr. Paul Fanning, I know you put your comment in the chat, but for most of us here, that writing's a little small. Do you mind just coming on mic and uh, adding to your comment as well? Thank you. I'd be glad to. Uh, I was just, you know, reflecting on the the comment there that the general public feels like there's all of this pollution happening from fertilizer and it, it could be that that's because there have been so much coverage in the national news about the algae blooms and other pollution artifacts on the Mississippi, Upper Missouri and, and in the Midwest is what I'm thinking of, could be in some other places. And so that just, you know, the general public is not very well educated about agriculture in general and, and on this issue. Uh, that might be an opportunity for us in the Arkansas Basin to to start making that point very specifically when we're talking about water. And that, that is that our ag producers are efficient with their water use, are efficient with their chemical use. And uh, I I know a few of you in the room there. I, I, I help with the outreach with the Arkansas Basin Roundtable with the education and outreach. And I think this is something that we can do with our uh, education and outreach on the round table is to start raising that that uh, awareness across the state that our ag producers are not contributing to those kinds of problems with, with water pollution. So thank you for bringing that topic up. Great. Any other input on the 
you know, agricultural affecting water from Dylan or Mike. Awesome. All right. Um, how, uh, how about this? How is Pueblo and the lower Arkansas Valley unique in its, in its use and availability of agricultural water? I know, you know, we're, we are pretty unique in the fact that water comes down the Bessemer ditch and we have the Pueblo Reservoir to supply municipalities and there's the great partnership between, um, you know, some farms having to dry up, but we can possibly transfer that water to better land. So how is how does that uniqueness, or what are some other aspects of the uniqueness that Pueblo has, um, lower arc, that the lower arc has, that makes us, you know, hopefully an agricultural community for the future? Anybody, take it away. Um, I put four answers down. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Came prepared. Well, you, you must have been like just so excited when the teacher said <laughs> pop quiz. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you know, you do something for 40 years, you kind of learn. Um, the most unique thing we have is Kansas. <laughs> we do have Kansas. Because, because Kansas, more than anything, um, has, has influenced a lot of programs in the Arkansas sure. First was the well pumping, um, a couple different ways. There were, there were old well pumping rules that <clears throat> were statewide that Kansas did not felt, feel like applied to the Arkansas Valley. So they, they uh, brought a lawsuit in the United States Supreme Court and and prove that case. Um, so we, we had well rules in 1996 as a result of that. That's unique because the well rules in each of the seven divisions in Colorado are all different. Um, then it led to another series of events that after, the, after 2000 as the case was winding down the, the state crackdown on seed ditches. Um, then the surface irrigation rules were promulgated in about 2010. And, and so Kansas would be a big factor that makes us unique. I think, I think the second thing I thought of then was that we have a big percentage of small irrigated farms. Um, it's not an environment that's friendly to corporate farming at all. You don't have big, vast stretches of land like you do in other parts of the country. So that's kind of the uniqueness that we have. Um, we, in in many years, and every, almost every year with the Briar Project, and then a lot of years with the municipal leases, we have a, a supply of supplemental water. We also one of the things that the prior the southeastern district does is we sell return flows which go to augment those those uh wells and why is paul screaming <laughs> that's <laughs> what he's going um, around he's yeah. being paul playing um, <laughs> <laughs> so the uh so the source those sources of supplemental water are available and as, as Mike was saying that you know in the outlook this year that where the farmers might start getting in trouble is in, in that July August time frame because all the you know especially with the monsoon sometimes there's no rain coming out that's a lot a lot of the time will be the time of year when they run their project water their winter water to finish off a crop. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other, the fourth unique thing we have is the uh, availability of storage and reservoirs. Um, the Pueblo, for one, but many of the downstream uh, dish companies also have, have developed reservoirs so they can sure. store water in there and and irrigate for that. And I think those are probably the four biggest things that I thought of that that have that make this a different kind of place. Awesome. Yeah. It's great. 
No, I, I, I think that's very comprehensive. Sounds like you need your home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, speaking of storage, I suppose then we can kind of bump back up to that, that third question um, just about, you know, the levels of water in the reservoir, are they coming up? Um, how does water storage look and what can farmers do if it ever were to rain here? Um, <laughs> could, could farmers store some of that rainwater on their property? What does that look like for them? Mike, would that affect Bessemer Ditch water? How, how does that look? Well, you can't store um, that water. That's the junior water right okay. <laughs> when it falls. Um, there's always been that discussion. That, uh, farmers want to see if we could hold it and store it and uh, use it at different times in the year. But, um, you know, when you get them big floods, the priority system, there's a lot of water rights that unless you get the big storm, Right. They don't ever come into priority and don't ever get any water. Sure. Um, so, no on, on the storm of the rainwater. Um, the irrigation runoff being captured and reused, I think it's 72 hours, isn't it, Hoss? You can catch it in a, in a pond below your field and recirculate it, but it has to be used within 72 hours. Um, so there's minimal time to it. Uh, reservoirs, they, they came up some with the one water storage. Yeah, you probably got the percentage. Typically, typically in, a, in a year, probably go through phases where it's storing yeah. water. Um, and, and right now, it's in some years it stores so much water that there has to be a big release right at the beginning of spring you know after march 15th if the reservoir well is it that up is after it, april 1st if the reservoir is uh has more water in, in that flood pool that's above the conservation pool then we have to start releasing some of the water. We're not in that situation this year. We're, we're at about uh, 225,000 acre feet as of today. Um, and it's slowly come up over the last few months because it'll go down and it'll reach its lowest point right around November 15th when we start storing in the water. Okay. So it's kind of cyclical that way. Um, <clears throat> still, that's about 100% of average this time of year, so we're not doing too bad. Um, we've got about 34,000 acre feet of winter water that was stored in there this year. There, correct. That's all. I, I know it's astounding. And then uh, <laughs> we have 5,300 acre feet of 2021 winter water. It's very specific who has that water in there. It's, uh, it's a public gallon. Um, I don't count what flows theirs out. I think we have a little bit in there. Yeah, because we didn't want to run it. Uh, I didn't want to run the project or it probably ended up right. But yeah, I think we have I think we have a little bit of we usually like to carry over our winter water from the next year to start yeah. irrigation. But. So and to answer another of your questions that agriculture has that amount of storage, but it's not very, very extensive. They okay. can't store project water sure. from one year to the next like the cities can. But they can store it until May 1st of the following year. Okay. Um, and there's about 1,900 acre feet of, of 2021 project water still in, in the Pueblo Reservoir as of today. Um, as Mike said, you can't capture and reuse native water, um, and farmers can't store rainwater, but they can. Um, Claim and reuse if they have a way to do it. Fully consumable water that's from Trans Mountain flows. Okay. And I don't know that many of the ditches still have that kind of water. Catlin at one time had the Bark Spring. Um, so the Terra had Clear Creek. Back. Yeah. They don't have Terra had Clear Creek, which we was brought by the water. water. Twin was the Colorado Canal, and it's now Wrestling Municipal Water. Right. 
So, so the storage that, that farmers had, um, some of it, some of it's gone away. It was awkward to maintain. Sure. There was, uh, I recall from reading some old articles in the chief that in the 1940s, there were, was it a, a gun battle over some people trying to shepherd water from uh, Twin Lakes down to, to the valley there. <laughs> So, you know, it wasn't, I don't think they fired any shots, but there was a standoff and made the papers. Um, the other, the other thing that to, to let you all know that the Southeast district did recently is that uh, we had a, a pilot program going on with the Fort Lyon Canal where they could <coughs> take the first right of refusal on the return flows from their own water and reuse that. That led to a change in our return flow policy where we will allow any ditch to, to do that okay. now to fill not only the well augmentation plans that are on the ditch, but the rural tent augmentation plans that are on the ditch with the surface irrigation rules. So that our board approved that uh, at our March meeting, and uh, so the, a ditch company can go in and, and buy their own return flows and use it for the well owners on that ditch. So those, those are the latest developments on Great. on how that works. All right. Well, let's hope it rains a lot. <laughs> um, we have about maybe like one. Let's do just one more question, um, and maybe you guys have an answer for this. Maybe you don't, and then maybe the the audience might have some other questions, but um, anyone have any more updates or news on the water anti-speculation laws that had been proposed? All right, Jess. Yes. Um, so what, what that is, the anti-speculation law that is proposed this year is called Senate Bill 22029. Um, it's not had any support. So it was introduced in January and didn't move anywhere. Um, it was it was kind of, I, I think it would have had lukewarm support from, from some uh, agriculture groups and conservation groups alike. But what it what it did was um, Try to prevent speculation by having by not letting hedge funds and speculators clear out and to to what a point Paul made online there. Um, I think it was a reaction to national news stories that were coming out saying that there were hedge fund speculators buying up water rights in Colorado. These these stories came out early last year and and kind of alarmed people of what was going on. But what this law says is that the, then the, the state engineer would have to make the determination that they were hedge fund and speculators. And so now you're asking somebody whose job it is to enforce water laws to go in and say, okay, uh, I think you're speculating. So, without it ever having gone to court. How do you do that? So it was, and on top of that, there were um, both from Pro 15, which is a uh, progressive 15, most east part of the state, Club 20 and Action 22 all took stances against this because it was a, a free market issue with them. Um, I think that if you look at what actually has happened with anti-speculation, the, the state Supreme Court has been really successful in shutting down those type of things where they have have not identified who the end user of the water is. And so that even if the hedge fund is buying up the water, um, that it would be cut, it would be extremely difficult to get that through a court and say, yeah, this is okay, okay to do. The court has consistently ruled that with AWDI, with 
with uh, all of the attempts on the Fort Lyon, Fort Lyon. Um, said that if you don't have an end user, you can't do it. And you know, the one the one outlier there was uh, Agora <clears throat> buying a, um, you know, with the rig group back in the 1980s that I bought some of the, some of the uh, Rocky Ford Canal at that point. And, you know, rig was bought by the rig group, but it was fairly transparent that the water was going to the floor. So I, I think um, they said that the, the interim water committee that kind of brought that bill to the forefront had to ask a group to work on some sort of legislation um, and wasn't really happy with the results. So they brought this bill forward, maybe re rewritten yet, but I think they need better ways to measure, you know, who's a speculator than, than just saying, this guy's got a lot of money, so he must be a speculator. Would, would that, if that bill was in place, would that have prevented Bubble Ford Water Works from buying the bus no water? No, because, that was a direct, a direct thing. It, it wouldn't have, it mm -hmm. wouldn't have affected. I, I think things like that or tri-state buying the, the canal down there. Those were fairly transparent deals. I think this one is like aimed at people who would amass a lot of water rights and then, and then try to, to move them. More like the high plains A and M one, or like. I just was. I mean. In, in, in my perception of the deal, that speculation is pretty much what Pueblo has done. They didn't need the water right then. And, and, and not just Pueblo, every municipality that's buying water, mm -hmm. they're buying it now because it's cheaper right now than it's going to be later on. Yeah. Well, and, and with municipalities, they, they like to have a firm source of water. So it's, it, and there's a, doctrine within water law called great and growing cities that allows Colorado water law to, that allows cities to plan for their future needs in that way. Um, and I don't, and, but this law was aimed at specifically at hedge fund you know, water rates. I feel like that law started out in the San Luis Valley with some serious fear mongering. Yeah, um, there were some pretty big people looking at buying some pretty big properties and everyone in the valley went, oh my gosh, they're going to ship it out. And I don't think the people that were looking at buying the land were looking at shipping the water out. I think they were looking at farming and continuing some operations. And, but I, I think that was a noble solution searching for a problem. I think it was also driven by uh, said Senator. Look, Don Coram and Carrie Donovan were the sponsors. Mm -hmm. They heard they heard from a bunch of Grand Valley water users on the Government Highline Canal and Mesa Orchard because there were some there were some sales there and with the demand management on the Colorado River, whatever that might mean, it's out there. That term is out there, and the discussion is. Would Colorado pay Colorado water users not to irrigate, to then put water into one of the vessels, you know, Mead or Powell, and, and save that as a way to make up a shortfall? I think that attracted some sharks, and and that's kind of another way where that impetus came from. And it, it, it's yeah, I mean, I was kind of I would I would agree with your diet with your supposition that we've had a fairly rigorous enforcement of our anti-speculation doctrine. And it's kind of difficult. What if I wanted to buy his farm and I was just a bigger farmer and I wanted to expand? Am I, am I, a, spe am I a speculator? Well, maybe I think it's going to go up in value, but I kind of want to keep farming, right? And that's yeah. why I got two kids that want to farm. I'd like to buy his farm, right? So there was, gonna... there was actually one of the lines in there was limiting the amount of water one person can own. Yes, I remember. I remember seeing that. Right. And I mean, I don't so know. it's tough. I mean, that's, that's we're going to have to definitely rework that thing over more. Yeah, I think. Yeah, that, and I and I agree, Chris. I think we'll see it back. Yeah. Yeah, I, they're not. 
they're not that way. Yeah, the, the reasons Matt said, you know, why those stories popped up in the first place. And I think it was driven by, it's a little bit of a knee-jerk reaction. And and people being, uh, the, the, genuinely being ex interested or nervous too, maybe. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But if you're flowing the, the water downstream, the state buys in stream, already in the state's the only one that can do it. Right. And, and uh, so it, it, some uh, some people, it, and, and this has sparked rigorous conversations among, you know, front range water users, but among ourselves, because we, you know, there's a difference of opinion in that. Right. But if you could like the, the whole question of how you shepherd water down to power uh, we had a, a program last year with Colorado Springs Aurora and Pueblo we're all in it uh, uh, kind of a pilot program that the state engineer said it's really inconclusive whether you could do it or not so right. uh, it's a long way to it's a long way to run water from the state line of Colorado into power well, and to, and to even to even prove that you, you forgone something there, right? I mean, so if you don't store water one year and then you store water the next year, have you really done it? Right? That, those type of questions. Right. Come on. Cool. That's got all the questions. I have any other questions or comments from the audience, the folks online? Good panel. At least I came from Mike. Yeah. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> Appreciate your interest in, in yeah. the topic. So, Thank you. Yeah. Um, and so we also, you know, it, would like to continue on this conversation as you know, as time goes on, um, at event and at another point if we have more water issues or hopefully water good things to talk about, we'd still love to be able to come together. And, um, and discuss that. We do have a survey, if you all wouldn't mind just taking a quick survey for us, just to gauge where we are with extension and what we what programming we can provide for the community. Um, we'd love for, for to hear your feedback. And really, thank you guys. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan, all for being here and hope for water year and agriculture <laughs> continues on. So thank you guys so much. Good, Good job. Thanks for watching this first water roundtable session with the Pueblo County Extension Office Agriculture Team. Our second water roundtable session is planned for Friday, May 27th at 6 p.m. again at the CSU Extension Office here in Pueblo County, where it will be offered in both a in-person and virtual format via Zoom. If you'd like the Zoom link, please reach out to the Pueblo County Office and we can get it to you. The topic for the Friday, May 27th event is planned to be water storage and the different opportunities you can take advantage of regarding that topic in Pueblo County. If you're interested in getting that Zoom link, please give us a call at 719-583-6566. And of course, be sure to follow and like us both here on YouTube and on the Pueblo County Extension Ag and Natural Resources Facebook page. Thanks for watching.